Well, good morning. We are in week two of a series on the Holy Spirit called Wind and Fire. Last week, we said the Old Testament word for spirit is roalch, and the New Testament word for spirit is pneuma. And both of these words have, a, have their root in their, this, the meaning of the wind, um, a, a breath of air. And Jesus said in John chapter 3 that the Holy Spirit works like the wind, like a breath of air. You, you don't know where the wind is coming from. You don't know where the wind is going. Wind is one of these rare things that is non-physical but, but tangible, meaning that you can see, can't see it but you can, you, and you can't grab it. You can't grab a hold of it, but you can feel it. You, can't, you can feel it and you can see the effects of it. While I was in the military, I had a friend of mine whose family had a, a sailboat that was, uh, they had a dock the marina there on San Francisco Bay. And, and I had uh, several opportunities to go sailing um, and it was an enjoyable time. And I remember the first, the very first time going out on a sailboat with them and we trolled out you know, the marina using a motor. And then uh, once we were out in the open, they're like, okay, let's put the sails down. John, you can put the sail down and, and extend, and so, or hoist the sails, as they call it. Um, and, uh, and so they weigh a lot. The, the sails are heavy. I mean, there's a whole pulley and lever, lever system that, that, yeah, this makes it easier. And, and even when this, this, this body, this, yes, this body was in top military form, and it was once, and it looked good, but I can't lie, but it was, it was, it was a challenge. I can't lie. It was still a challenge to hoist the sails. I mean, because it, they are heavy, even on a smaller sailboat. And, and once we had the sails up, though, nothing really seemed to happen. It just kind of sat there and limp. And so I, I, I asked the, the dad, and I was like, how, how do you know when the wind catches? This, you know, how, when, when's the wind going to catch the sails? And the, the dad kind of laughed and said, oh, oh, you'll know. You'll know when the wind comes. You'll know when it happens. And a few minutes later, sure enough, I about lost my footing because it caught and kind of jerked the, the boat a little forward and, and there was a loud whoosh sound and, and the wind filled the cell. And uh, the motor was turned off and we made our way on our little trip in the bay. And when the wind caught the cell, everyone knew it. Everyone could tell that something had happened, something changed. In this series, this is the point we're making as we talk about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit should have such an impact on our lives and on this church that everyone knows when it happens. Even if they don't quite understand Him, even if they, don't, they can't see Him, they can see the effect He has. So the question that I asked you to wrestle with is, as we go through the series is, if the Holy Spirit were to leave, would anyone notice? If the Holy Spirit were to leave you, would you notice? If the Holy Spirit were to leave this church, would anybody notice? Or would things just continue as usual? Because we can get to a place where we play it safe and everything is predictable and this is how we do things and we don't make changes and the Holy Spirit leaves and we just, business as usual. Is that how it works? Or, or are we really dependent on Him? Are we really open to where the wind would blow us. So last week we talked about the fact that essential to understanding the Holy Spirit is to understand Him as a person. The relational dynamic that's evolved, that, that closeness there. And, and the problem we said for many of us is that we think of the Holy Spirit as a what rather than a who. And we speak of the Holy Spirit as an it rather than a he. And we relate to the Holy Spirit as a force rather than a friend. And as long as this is our thinking, as long as this is our approach to the Holy Spirit, the rest of it doesn't work. It just, it won't. It, it begins with this understanding that the Holy Spirit is a person. And the relational dynamic involved is more significant than we realize. And so the purpose of this study is not then to deepen our understanding of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of this study is to deepen our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And those are two really profoundly different outcomes. And this weekend's message is titled, The Promise of the Holy Spirit. Last week we listened as Jesus promised his followers that the Holy Spirit would come. It was just before Jesus was going to leave the earth, and he said to them, I'm going to have to leave, but God is going to send the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another. Do you remember that word, another? Another just exactly like me an advocate, a helper, a comforter, a counselor, 
a friend, to help you and be with you forever. Jesus goes on to say, the Holy Spirit, he, he lives within you and will be, he lives with you and will be in you. And then in Acts 1, 8, just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he again promises the Holy Spirit. And he says to his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And so then Jesus is gone, but for a bit, nothing happens. I don't know what it was like for the followers during that time, really. I mean, I mean well, how are we going to know? How are we going to know when the wind comes? Oh, you'll know. You'll know. Next chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. Verse 1 in the fo- and following. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind. Whoosh. Came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. On down we read about Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he begins to preach the sermon to thousands of people who were there. And the Bible says that the people who heard Peter's sermon, it says in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. This cut to the heart, that the whole, that, that's, that's Holy Spirit stuff. The Bible says that we in our in of ourselves cannot be drawn to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit who draws us. It is the Holy Spirit who calls us. And I have experienced just this phenomenon when I read about an act, what I read about in Acts as a preacher. When you when you get up here and you preach and you talk to someone afterwards and they were cut to the heart. And they make a decision, and it had an impact on them. But as, but as they're telling you about what, they, about what you said in your sermon, you realize you didn't really say that, right? Like the Holy Spirit was connecting some dots that you didn't intentionally connect. But see, that's how he works. And so there are, they were cut to the heart after hearing the sermon. And they said to Peter and to the other apostles, what do we do? How do we respond to this? They're convicted of their sin. What do we do to be saved? And Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they say to Peter, what do we do? How do we respond? And Peter doesn't do this. He doesn't say, well, there are a lot of people here, so let's do it uh, this way. If you think you need to make a decision today, then just go ahead and raise your hand. And with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, well, we could do it this way. I'm going to pray a prayer. We're all going to call, we're going to just call it the sinner's prayer. And you can just repeat after me whatever I say. And the sinner's prayer will be a promise for you and all those far off. That, that's, that's not what he says. Now, there's nothing wrong with raising a hand and praying a prayer. I mean, the sinner's prayer is a, is a prayer of repentance, a prayer of desire, where you make it clear that this is what you believe and this is what you want. It's a prayer of surrender. So those things are good. And, and, they're, and it's a great place to start. But what Peter says here is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I want you to catch here is what Peter does. He paralleled some things in this statement. He parallels repentance and being baptized with forgiveness of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. It, it's what that it's what that is. It's being bap, it, It's and being baptized isn't something you do. Some sometimes people get this a little un, get a little uncomfortable because they think of baptism as a as a work. You know, the working. It's not. It's not a work. You're being baptized. It's an act of act of submission. It's an act of surrender. It's something that that's done to you. And so Peter says, "This is this is the promise." And one of the key principles of interpreting the scripture is to understand the genre of what you're reading. And so the book of Acts then is historic literature. It's history. 
It's an account of something that happened. And if you're interpreting history, literature, one of the things that you keep in mind is that something that happened once doesn't necessarily mean it always happens that way. That could be dangerous to say, oh, this is an account of what happened then, and because it happened then that way, then it's the way it should always happen. That, that's not how we read historical literature. In other words, the book of Acts is not prescriptive. It's descriptive. It describes what happens. It's not necessarily a prescription for the way it should always happen. And yet when Peter says this, when he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and the gift of the, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, as, it's as if the Holy Spirit inspired him to know that there was going to be this hermeneutical objection. That people would say, okay, well, yeah, that's how it was happened, and, you know, it happened then. But that doesn't mean it has to happen this way now. And so Peter says, and he adds, after he says this promise, he says, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So in other words, Peter says, and, and this isn't just happening now. This promise isn't just good for today. This promise applies to you and your children and for those who are all far off. What we do see is Peter saying, this is how it happened. And this is how it, how, this is how it will happen. And so you repent and you be baptized. And if, you've been, if you put your trust in Jesus, and if you believe Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, but you, you haven't done those things, then there, there are some things you need to take care of. And the Bible says, for those who do this, there is the forgiveness of sins. There is receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so there's, there's the promise of the Holy Spirit, and all those who put their trust in Jesus receive him. But we, we all have, ex I mean, we've all had experiences receiving a gift, right? A really, a, a good gift. But what, what about that one that remains unopened and unused? So imagine it this way. Imagine there are a couple of acres that need to be cleared, and, and that's your job. It's your job to clear the, clear the trees. So let's imagine that your, your wife knows that you, you've got this job that needs to be taken care of. And so she gets you this nice, big, manly chainsaw. You know, one of those big ones, like you see the lumberjacks out in Alaska have, like 10 foot long. Yeah, those things are huge. Brand new, in the box, and it's perfect for cutting trees down. Perfect. But it's a little bit big. And it's pretty powerful. And you think, maybe... Maybe it's too powerful, right? Maybe it's too powerful. And so you don't even open the box. You don't. You just stick it up in the attic. It's a little intimidating, right? It's a little overwhelming, but you've got lots of trees that need to be cleared. So you go out the next day, and you pull out your, your, your trusty pocket knife. It's a nice one, by the way. It's a Swiss Army pocket knife. And you start to work on that first tree with your pocket knife, getting the biggest blade out. You pop that thing open, and by the end of the day, the blade is down to a nub, and your knuckles are bloody from the bark, and your hands are cramped up, and you've barely made a dent in that tree. And you, and you realize you're going to be here for months if this is all you've got to use. But in the attic, there's this brand new chainsaw sitting in the box. Now look, I'm not comparing the Holy Spirit to a chainsaw. Save your leathers, please. That's, that's not the point I'm making, okay? I, I get it. The Holy Spirit is not a tool in our hands that we use for our purposes. Uh, it's just the opposite. We are a tool in His hands that are available to accomplish His purpose. What I am saying is that many of us live our lives like a guy who goes out to cut down a forest with a pocket knife when there's a chainsaw boxed up and unopened in the attic. You've received the gift, but it's boxed up. I know that this week we will have an opportunity to realize, if you're a follower of Jesus, to realize the promise that the Holy Spirit has been given to you. We'll have an opportunity to live out that promise. We'll have an opportunity to hoist the sails and allow the sails to be filled, filled with the wind. But what does that look like? How, how do you know when that happens? There are a couple of different ways in Scripture that we can see the evidence for the Holy Spirit in our lives. And you can think in terms of two categories. And you think of category number one is gifts. Other category is fruits. There are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We kind of have these two lists given to us in Scripture. One of the things you'll notice is that oftentimes when the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is talked about, 
It tends to be focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're supernatural or powerful demonstrations. We'll talk about some of these next week. But the point I want to make here is that, in my opinion, I mean, this is my opinion. In my opinion, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, more so than the gifts of the Holy Spirit, are evidence of a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit. Right? See, now, now that these two things go together, but the fruit of the Spirit, I think, is, is, so, is more than the gifts. And it demonstrates a deep relationship. I'm not saying they're, they're more effectively dis- demonstrate the Holy Spirit. They, they're, they're more effectively demonstrate a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Paul seems to get this, uh, uh, get at this in, in 1 Corinthians 13. So in 1 Corinthians 12, he gives us a list of gifts, supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the primary fruit of love. Love is patient, love is kind, and so on. In between talking to us about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, here's, here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1. He says, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, if I speak in tongues but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It, I'm just making noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can't fathom, and I can fathom all the mysteries and all the, and all the knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move a mountain, but I do not have love, I am nothing. I need you to hear that. So what Paul is saying here is, look, if you have these gifts of the Holy Spirit, but if you don't have this fruit of the Holy Spirit, then, you're, then you've missed the point of the Holy Spirit. Then you are nothing. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, but I certainly don't have time to go into depth. Of, I mean, we, we could do a whole series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 gives us a list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And so he goes through this, this, these fruits of the Spirit. And I was trying to decide, which one should I talk about? So I found a list that was put together from some kids the, talking to, about their fathers and their older kids. Um, and, and in the third place on this list, the third, third place, was patience. Okay, it turns out it takes a little patience to be a father. It does. Uh, but you know, it, it takes probably more patience to be a mother um, because they have to be patient with the kids and, and the father. So um, I thought maybe that might not be the one to talk about then. Uh, the runner-up uh, is coming in second place with self-control. But number one, number one, now see, this will surprise you. I mean, at least it did me. Gentleness. Hmm. If they were to have asked the dads that, I can tell you that gentleness would probably be on the other side of that list, on the bottom. I think that surprises me because gentleness is usually overlooked when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Gentleness tends to be, if you will, the, the rhubarb of the fruit of the Spirit. Like, you're vaguely aware that it's a fruit. But... It's not something you give a lot of time to and and attention to and seek after. Maybe the reason it's got some extra votes in this definition, it's because of the definition here I put next to gentleness. So here it is. It's gentleness. It's it's a power and strength that is under control for the benefit of someone else. Hmm. All right, you got that? It's power and strength that has been disciplined. It's under control so that people around you will benefit from it. And that's, that sounds not just like, that sounds not just like gentleness, but that sounds like patience, right? That sounds like self-control. And most men, I don't think, are especially interested in growing in gentleness because we tend to associate gentleness with weakness. We tend to think of a gentle person who isn't aggressive enough to win the game or isn't driven enough to climb the ladder of success. A gentle person gets taken advantage of. A gentle person, it's been my observation, they don't get the good parking spots. Like, that's a broad observation, but just anecdotally, I think that's, that's right. My thesaurus helped me understand why men weren't interested, maybe perhaps, in gentleness. Some of the synonyms for gentleness include mild, tender, 
docile and soft. Well, what man wants that? I've been called some names in my life, right? I, I laugh most of them off. But if you call me tender and docile and soft, all right, we got, might have to go a few rounds on that one. Like, that's, that's not going to be okay. <laughs> and yet, gentleness is, the, is a strength. It's a strength. It's not a weakness. It's strength that is under control for the benefit of someone else. That's real strength. There's a section in Galatians 5 where Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit where he gives us a different list. And it's sometimes called the acts of the sinful nature. And there's an act of the sinful nature that is kind of the, the opposite of gentleness. It is listed as maybe, maybe in your version, fits of rage or outbursts of anger. It's the opposite of gentleness. It's emotional frustration that is out of control to the detriment of everyone else. It's being disengaged from what's happening. And then something happens and suddenly you lose it and you're really engaged. It's a constant state of aggravation. It's, it's giving a constant scowl of disappointment or a heavy sigh of annoyance. It's the person who's always defensive and constantly critical in a perpetually bad mood. That's the opposite of gentleness. In Ephesians 4.30, we saw last week how we relate to the Holy Spirit. Paul says, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Don't make the Holy Spirit sad by the way you live, but put that verse in context. It's interesting because the next verse, 31, says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. So in context, what do we see? That at least some, to some degree, what brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit? Bitterness, rage, anger, harsh tones, grieves the Holy Spirit. It makes the Holy Spirit sad. And when he hears us speaking harshly to one another, filled with anger towards one another, it brings sorrow to the Holy Spirit. And so how do we do this? See, most of us, when we hear about a fruit of the Spirit, like gentleness or joy or patience or self-control, whatever it is, we immediately go to self-improvement plans, right? Okay, I'm convicted, so I need to change some things. Maybe anger management class, maybe a little self-help book. But see, that's not the idea here. The idea is that we have this promise from the Holy Spirit who we have received when we put our trust in Jesus. We raised ourselves. He fills ourselves. He grows gentleness in our lives. It's not about trying harder to be gentle. It's about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.25, Since we live, since we're powered by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's it. So how do we, how we do that? Well, there's just a few things to kind of think about this week. One step, or, or, or step one, would be repentance. Repentance makes room for the Holy Spirit in your life. Repentance says to the Holy Spirit, I know that my angry words and my harsh tones have made you feel unwelcome in my life. I acknowledge that my shortness with others and my angry outbursts have not only hurt them, but those things have hurt you. And I'm sorry. I know it's not just other people that I have sinned against. I know, Holy Spirit, I have sinned against you. I know I have not just grieved them, I have grieved you. And you repent. And the Holy Spirit knows that. He is welcomed. Step two would be surrender. Where throughout the day, as you keep in step with the Spirit, you surrender things. You surrender words before you speak them. You surrender your right to be offended when someone offends you. You surrender irritations and frustrations over to the Holy Spirit. Step three, I think, would be to ask. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You ask for the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says the Father will give you the Holy Spirit, fill you with the Holy Spirit. And so you just begin throughout the day by asking, Holy Spirit, work in my life today. I mean, there's this close correlation in the Scripture between being filled with the Holy Spirit and the words we speak. So an example or a, f or a few from Acts 4.8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
Acts 4.25, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant. Verse 31, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Then we look at Acts 2.4 earlier. They, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were speaking in languages or, or speaking in tongues that they didn't understand. They don't know the, the languages. They hadn't studied them. It's like me speaking Spanish. I never studied Spanish. You know, for a lot of us, the greatest manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives would be to speak a tongue of encouragement. To speak in a tongue of positivity. To speak in a tongue of grace and gentleness. Because that is a foreign language to you. And you haven't spoken it. And no one's taught you growing up. And if you want people to see the difference the Holy Spirit makes in your life, you start speaking that tongue that you, and you see what kind of impact it has on those around you. Step four, believe. You believe the promise of Jesus. In faith, you claim the promise that Jesus, that this is his gift to us. In faith, you claim the promise you claim the promise of Scripture that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us today. I heard a story about a woman named Christy Robinson. She runs a ministry called The Hope Place in a different city. And she reaches out to thousands of refugees, refugees who live in her city. And the need is significant. Within three blocks of where her ministry is located, there are more than 100 languages spoken. Christy grew up in a home where her dad struggled with alcohol and anger. And she remembers holes in the wall and picture frames that are broken and figurines that had been smashed. And at his angriest, he would take it out on her mom and she bore the scars. And when Christy looks back, she realizes that probably a lot of his anger came from his dad, who was an angry alcoholic, a war vet who suffered from PTSD. When Christy was still young, her brother was invited to go to a church by the pastor's son in the town. And her brother went to church and loved it. He came home and he, he wanted the whole family to go to church. And he kept asking and kept saying, we should all go. And they went from time to time, but her dad wasn't interested in those things. He was mostly just disengaged. The pastor of the church started inviting Christy's dad to play basketball with him in the rec league. And her dad liked basketball, so he started to go. And then eventually he was asked to go to a Christian men's conference with some other men in the church. And, and Christy said that when her dad came back from the conference, he was a completely different man. There was a night and day difference. He just wasn't the same person. Christy said he came back and he wanted us to all go to church every weekend together. And he did his best to start spiritually leading our family, even though he hadn't had that example growing up. And before her dad became a Christian, he often missed birthday parties and special events, but he became much more involved and much more engaged. Christy goes on to say, she said, once in a while my dad still lost his temper, but, but now when it happened, he would tell my mom he was sorry. He would apologize to us kids, and I would see him cry over his sin when my dad changed. She said, our whole family changed when he changed. When I saw the difference Jesus made in my dad, I wanted to know Jesus too. And Christy began her own search, her own journey of following Jesus. See, how do you know? How do you know when the wind catches the sails? <laughs> oh, you'll know when it happens. Please pray with me. God, I thank you that you have not left us alone here in this world to just figure things out, to muscle through it and try to row the boat ourselves out of our, through our own strength, Lord. But Lord, I, I, thank you for, I thank you for the gifts of your spirit. It's not by our might, it's not by our power, it's by your spirit. And we believe that, we claim in the faith. Lord, I am sorry for times where we have tried to go it alone. We've put our confidence in ourselves. We've taken credit for your work. Forgive us for that. And forgive us our sin, God. We repent of that. Holy Spirit, we want you to know that you are welcome in our lives and you are welcome in this church. I pray, God, that you would help us learn that 
it's not just believe that we've received a gift but to be filled, but I pray, Lord, that, that you let us this week keep in step with your spirit. Tell us to ask, and so we ask. It is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week.